Welcome to the Modern Intimacy Podcast, a show about mental health, sex, relationships, education and tips, and those private things we need to talk about more publicly without restrictions. I'm your host, Dr. Kate Balistrieri, a licensed psychologist, certified sex therapist, packed couples therapist, and sex addiction therapist. I know that mental health is directly tied to the quality of our relationships and our sex lives. I'm passionate in my desire to smash stigmas and shine a light on societal issues that may be negatively affecting our lives, relationships, and sexuality. During this podcast, I will also give you practical answers and insights to questions you've been wondering about. We should all have fulfilled, happy lives, and we get there by erasing shame, consciously digging deeper, building healthy connections, and by getting curious together. Thanks for joining me. Let's get started. Hi everyone, this week I am so excited to have with me Zachary Zane. Zach is a Brooklyn-based columnist, sex expert, and activist whose work focuses on sexuality, culture, and the LGBTQ community. He's the author of an upcoming book called Boy Slut, a memoir and manifesto, which releases on May 9th. And he's also the co-author of Men's Health, Best Sex Ever Book, and a prolific author in Men's Health, uh, columns explain it. Zach, thanks so much for being here with me today and taking some time out of your busy book uh, promoting tour to come and talk to me about it. How has it been so far for you in this process? It has been good. You, you know, things are moving along here. I feel like the first, now I have a sense of the type of questions people are going to ask. Of course, the first few interviews always, I'm used to doing interviews, but not specifically about the book. And they were definitely a little bit rockier. And now I feel like, okay, I know what's going to come at me. Hopefully there won't be any too big of surprises here. Um, But I think it's going well. And I'm excited to kind of share my story with the world here. This is a more vulnerable book. This is your memoir. It's your story. What prompted you to write it? It's it's funny because I have this... um, like digital zine, which publishes nonfiction erotica. And it's very raunchy and it's very kinky. And because of that, people assume that I'm actually quite open and vulnerable, but that's not exactly the case. Like I I, I am able, like for me, writing explicitly about sex does not constitute necessary, necessarily vulnerability, right? In this book, I talk about relationships with my family, the times that I've treated my partners less than ideally. And, you know, writing this, it was tough because I'm looking back at all the mistakes I've made. And of course, I never intentionally tried to hurt any partners, but through kind of careless behavior or being selfish or being young and naive, of course, I did hurt my partners, their feelings and having to relive that. But I really wanted to write this book because I hadn't seen it written. Uh, is kind of the shorter answer, but like, so it really is a bisexual memoir. And I haven't seen a book written by a bisexual man about how to overcome sexual shame. And one of the key things I discuss in this is that sexual shame is so universal. It is pervasive. It is insidious where a lot of the books that come out right now, it's people have experienced let's say a lot of trauma or something terrible has happened to them. Let's say you were a gay boy from the South who gets kicked out of his family because they're religious and that's kind of, and they move to New York city, find your chosen family. That's kind of like a narrative that we have. And that really doesn't speak to my experience. And you don't necessarily need to be kicked out of your family for being gay to have internalized homophobia. Um, So I talk about the fact that I grew up actually in a very queer affirming household. I have gay uncles on both sides of my family, my dad's brother, my mom's brother. Um, And it was like all things considered a sex positive household. And still I had so much sexual shame because it could not combat, you know, the negative messages we get from society, from our teachers, from sexual health educators, from media, from peers. So I, I think this book is more of a look at the way that, you know, sex negativity influences all of us in ways that we might not understand. And then how we overcome um, the sexual shame that we're experiencing to live more fulfilling lives and happier lives. 
And, and it accomplishes that. I really appreciate so much in your book talking about how you were in so much denial about your bisexuality for such a long time. And in college, you were engaging in sexual behaviors with men and people would ask you if you were bisexual and you would proudly explain to them, no, I'm straight. And I wonder for you if you can explain a little bit the process of understanding yourself given that dissonance. It, it took some time. And I feel like sometimes people are quite confused when like how long it took me to embrace being bisexual because I had my first same sex experience with a man like my first week of college and I was 18 and I kept getting drunk, like really blackout drunk because it kind of gave me this excuse where I was like, oh, I was super drunk. So it doesn't count when it's like, no, that's that's not how that works. And if you're doing something super drunk, probably means you also want to do it sober too. You just don't have the courage. Um, but at the time, so yeah, so that was 18. I was hooking up with guys for another like five, almost six years before like I embraced the label bisexuality. And it took so long because this was, I had my first same sex, same sex sexual experience when I was 18. I'm in my early thirties now. And when uh, this was happening, there was very little bisexual visibility, and it has really exploded in the past, I feel like five years, three years. And like the B and LGBTQ is finally getting some recognition here. But at the time, I didn't know a single other man who was bisexual. There was nothing like in the media about bisexual men. And every guy in college who came out as bi shortly after came out as gay. And so while I am egocentric and love talking and thinking about myself, I, I wasn't delusional. I'm like, I can't be the only man in the world with this sexual orientation. Um, and then also when I started Googling like about bisexuality, quickly what came up with bi men was like studies about having and spreading HIV was pretty much the predominant thing that came up when discussing bisexual men. Or there was a, a little bit of content back then still that was more geared towards monosexuals, towards gay and straight people, like trying to tell them to believe that we're real. So it was like, oh, 10 things to never say to bisexuals or 10 myths about bisexuality that aren't true. But there was very little bisexual content for bisexual people. And that's one thing I kind of became known for. And I really filled in this gap where I started discussing, you know, the challenges that come with dating when you're bisexual, how to overcome internalized biphobia. Uh, when can you call yourself bisexual if your attractions to, let's say, the same gender or the same sex are more fleeting and you never think you date someone, but you hook up with them? Like, can you be included in, in this community? How to come out to your family as bisexual, uh, as bisexual. So I really started writing content specifically for bi people, by bi people, addressing their issues. But so that partly explains why, A, why visibility is so important, but also why it took me so long to embrace who I was. And it, it only, I was very lucky where I was able, I saw specifically an LGBTQ affirming therapist after college. And the fact that I sought out an LGBTQ affirming therapist likely means I, I knew something was going on here. And I remember I picked him as my therapist because he was previously an attorney. And I said to him, I was like, hey, I often seek advice from my therapist. And I don't like, like by the time I, come to you, I've thought about everything every which way. And I know a lot of therapists are trained to not actually give advice. You know, they try to direct you so that you come to it yourself. But I'm like, I would actually like advice. And if it's wrong, that's okay. I'm not going to be mad at you. I just need another perspective and an opinion. He said, okay, I can do this for you. So on my first session, I'm talking, I kind of proceed to launch into this monologue about how I'm confused, how I think I'm gay, then I think I'm straight, and I know I love women. And I had been heartbroken by women, but I find myself drunk and hooking up with guys and that's kind of gay. And he couldn't get a, a word in edgewise. And then on our second session, I proceed kind of with a similar monologue and he interrupts me and he goes, Zach, uh, you said you would like me to be blunt. Uh, may, may I be blunt and direct with you? And I go, please. And he goes, you know, you keep using the word confused and the word confused actually has like a, a definition or meaning in terms of like discovering your sexuality. Um, and you don't sound confused. You sound very cl clearly bisexual. I is there something I I'm missing? And I was quick to respond, oh, that doesn't exist in men. 
And he responded, Zach, you're too smart to think that, which I think was kind of like almost a perfect response where it's like hitting your ego a little bit too with that. Um, And he essentially like granted permission for me to be bisexual and showed that bisexuality is an actual valid option. It's a a valid sexual orientation. And the moment he kind of said that, I didn't immediately embrace the label, but that definitely started my journey of acceptance being like, oh, this is real. Of course, this is, of course, this makes sense that it would be real. Some people, why would this not be real? Of course it is. And then from there, I was slowly able to embrace my bisexuality fully. But again, it took some time, right? It, It takes more than just one person saying, oh, you're clearly bi, but definitely having it from a health professional was super necessary for me to kind of embrace who I am. It sounds like just having someone reflect that back to you and really pinpoint it as something that is not only possible, but to be expected in humans gave you just yeah. gave your brain, your brain that was a little bit defended against a reality to open up and accept that perhaps some of what you believed about men was not true. And you could challenge that instead of your bisexuality. What are some of the concerns or issues or stigmas that you either experienced yourself or hear men experiencing as bisexual people that are, might be different from women or non-binary folks? It's funny because often I feel like these are pitted against each other where I'll have like bi women be like, oh, it's so much harder being a bi man. And I'm like, no, that's not what we're trying to accomplish here. I think there are different and unique struggles that come from being bisexual when you're identified as a man, woman, or non-binary. They're all valid. It's not, we're not trying to start an oppression Olympics here, but I think there are absolutely different challenges. Um, I think some of the main ones for a man is specifically that they're just secretly gay and that they're using this as a stepping stone or as a pit stop on the way to being full-blown gay. And they're just in denial about their sexuality. And and I understand where this is coming from. Um, I feel like often the visibility that we've had for so long is gay men using it as a stepping stone. You know, and especially if that has been their experience where the the three bi guys they knew later came out as gay and they don't know a single man who otherwise identifies as bisexual, I understand why that's what people think is the truth. But needless to say, that's obviously not the truth. There are plenty of people for whom bisexuality is a stable orientation. Um, I think that's the big one. And then there are also some like stereotypes that are... It's interesting. I try to make a distinction between like stereotypes that are inherently bad versus ones that are just like, it's bad because we're making an assumption about a group of people. And what I mean by that is like, assuming let's say bisexuals are slutty and unable to be monogamous, it's like, oh, well, there's nothing wrong with polyamory. There's nothing wrong with being slutty. What's wrong is the assumption that everyone who's bisexual is slutty and non-monogamous. But if you're able to like, for me, a part of my bisexuality greatly intersects with my non-monogamous identity. And like, because I'm bisexual, I am non-monogamous. Like I I do need people uh, of all genders by my side. I do miss having sex with men when I'm having sex with women. I do miss having sex with non-binary and trans people. Like I I do want it all. I'm that greedy bisexual stereotype. And that's okay because I'm honest about it with my partners. I communicate that this is what I am. I'm never lying, saying I'm monogamous and cheating. Obviously, you know, cheating is not something like assuming that we're cheaters is wrong and not ideal, right? That's something to do with ethics, but just being non-monogamous, there's nothing wrong with that. So I try to make these distinctions. Um, yeah. And of course, like, you know, women, it really goes back to almost the patriarchy where it's no matter what the assumption is that you like men, right? So if you're bisexual, oh, you're actually just gay. If you are a woman, oh, you actually are just doing it for attention, but are going to end up with a man and actually like men too. So the default assumption, regardless of gender, is that no matter what, you're ending up with a man because Lord forbid you can't be attracted to men because men are everything. You know what I mean? So like, it's interesting and that's that's how it manifests. I think a lot of women get a lot more proposition for threesomes. Obviously, like they call this like unicorn hunting and there's been a lot more like poly activists and bi activists being like, just because I am... Bisexual doesn't mean I want to be have a threesome with you. I can actually be monogamous. And even if I do like having threesomes, which many, of course, by women and everyone does, 
Does it mean I want to do it with a couple I don't know who's clearly experimenting, not going to involve me or take me seriously or prioritize my pleasure? You're just using me as a vehicle for your exploration. Like I actually want to be a third party member and actually a part of this, which often is not the case. So I think some of those, those are some of kind of the distinctions between bisexual experiences, depending on gender. You mentioned sluttiness, and this is one of the things I love so much about you and your work. You champion sluttiness as an okay way to be. And I wonder how you define that and how you talk about that and infuse it into both your work and your approach to sexuality. I I think I really try to kind of dispel a lot of stereotypes about sluts. You know what I mean? That this idea that, okay, we are not smart. We all have daddy issues um, that we're, we're secretly, you know, we're feeling the hole we should be filling is the hole in our heart when really, instead of filling the hole in our asshole or our vagina, whatever the fuck it is, you know what I mean? But it's like really showing that like you can be a healthy, mature, happy person. And just because you want to pursue pleasure, and sexual connections with people uh, d- doesn't have anything to do with any other aspect uh, of your identity. And being a slut can coexist with anything. Um, and I, I really think so much of like the, the, the issues that we have in this world, you know, come from sexual shame, come from not being able to have pleasure or feeling guilt for having sex. And it, it's not just, and this is something I try to relay in my book, where it's like sex influences everything. It doesn't just influence our identity, it influences our relationship with our friends and family, our overall happiness, um, how we are at work, uh, anything. And so when you're not having a fulfilling sex life, this impacts you in so many negative ways. It impacts the entire world and every single relationship you have. So that's why this is important. And one thing I also try to make clear in the book, it's I don't define like a slut by like your body count. That's actually not what it's about. Actually, do I'm going to do, hold on. Can I just read? Uh, I'm going to read something quickly if I may. Yes. If I if I may read this from the book. I, I have a definition of boy slut in this book. So I have a glossary at the beginning. And Let's honestly, instead it. of me rambling about it, I should probably just read what I wrote here. Boy slut. You might not be thrilled by the title of this book or by the fact that I call myself and readers boy sluts. After all, the word slut is highly gendered, and it has seldom been hurled at me and men as an insult intended to harm, belittle, or control my behavior. Men are often praised for having sex with a lot of women. They're called a player or a regular Don Juan, whereas women are deemed simply sluts. This pervasive double standard is not new, and men have always benefited from it. I know I have. Unfairly, women who are called sluts are often deemed either mentally unwell, she's got real daddy issues, or undeserving of love. I'd never marry a slut. So why do I feel it's my right to reclaim a word that hasn't typically been used to hurl, to hurt and control me? First, I choose to identify as a boy slut because it exposes the double standard of promiscuity associated with men and women, and in doing so, hopefully works to dismantle it. Second, as someone who also proudly identifies as a queer faggot, I know the power of reclamation. I hope to remove some of the stigma and shame that accompanies being a boy slut or slut. So what exactly is a boy slut? I define it as a person of any gender or sexual orientation who approaches sex without a lick of judgment or shame. Being a boy slut is not about having a high body count. It's about having the sex you want with whomever you want, however you want, without shame. Identifying as a boy slut is to give a gigantic middle finger to society, letting everyone on this planet know that you will not be controlled or behave a certain way just because that's what's considered normal, ethical, or right. Love it. There we go. (laughs) Love it. It's, It's so empowering to hear you intentionally use this language that has been so demonizing for folks, especially women or female bodied people. Um, and I wonder, are you getting any pushback uh, around this term? Because I, I recall seeing on your Twitter a couple weeks ago, um, a thread that you started because somebody actually said to you that they were impressed by your writing or something. And you said, what, did you think I was a bad writer? And I wonder if that relates to this idea of sluttiness that you claim and are people 
do people start to apply some of those double standards that are typically held for women around not being smart if they are slutty? Um, are you experiencing some of that backlash? I, I think that is something that I do experience. I, I think just by using the word slut, I, I've run into kind of two issues. So one is that where, again, there's this assumption that if you are slutty, you are stupid or uneducated. And like, where does that even come from? Like, like, they're totally two completely separate things. And, you know, how come pursuing pleasure, enjoying connections with people somehow makes you dumb? However you're defining it. You know what I mean? Right. Um but yeah, so so the tweet was just like, yeah, you're actually like quite a good writer, like, and there was a surprise to it. I'm like, why are you surprised? I've written for New York Times, Rolling Stone, Washington Post, GQ. I have a sex column at Men's Health. I have a relationship column at uh, Cosmo. I, I, I've been a writer, a professional writer, for nearly a decade. Like, I wouldn't be able to reach this level of prominence if I wasn't a decent writer. But it was just because the word "slut" is in the title that they assumed the quality of writing wasn't going to be there. Well, I, I appreciate you speaking to it. It's something that so many women experience. And uh, I hate that you experience that kind of shaming. I'm going to call it shaming because it really is. It's a degradation yeah. of your humanity. Um, the assumption that you're not intelligent because you like sex and you talk about it. I certainly hear that a lot. People are surprised that I have an education or surprised with some of the language that I use. I'll often hear, oh, you're so articulate. I didn't expect that from you, <laughs> which is funny. And you're, yeah, articulate's a word. You should. It, it's such a condescending euphemism. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. It really Whenever is. someone, oh, you're you're at, articulate. It's like, why would you assume otherwise? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I love in your book that you talk really honestly and humbly about the way you have fumbled rejection. And I wonder if we can spend a little bit of time talking about rejection as a whole, because it's such a universal experience. I don't know anyone who's not been rejected. Um, and you just give it such uh, such levity and, and uh, an elevated glimpse. So can you say a little bit about your experiences? Sure. It was for me, like, and I didn't initially plan on kind of having this chapter in the book. I'm not going to say it's like outside the scope of the book, but it's definitely a little adjacent. But the reason why I decided to write it up was because I was struggling with it. You know, it's something I've been struggling with in therapy. And again, I approach this not from being like, oh, I'm an expert who knows everything. It's someone who's like, okay, I've done the reading. I've spoken to therapists. I've done the research. I have a understand it through that lens, but also as someone who's struggling with it, I can probably speak to some of your insecurities as well. Um, for me specifically, I struggle less with being rejected as much as I struggle with rejecting other people. Um, and I feel extremely responsible for their feelings and emotions. And one thing I kind of talk about in the book is definitely there are times where I have fucked up in my relationships or fucked up in terms of dating and someone where I've not made it clear that I wanted this to be more casual or I did lead them on. And I did this obviously in college in my early twenties when I didn't have kind of the language to communicate. And I was a little bit of a fuck boy because I was in my early twenties and not excusing it, but like, that's kind of what I was. Um, and the few times I felt like I tried to kind of be direct and honest of being been like, Hey, I had a fun time. I, I think it's just going to be a one-time thing. I didn't feel that connection, but I think you're great. I was often met with like such anger and rage where it was just like, fuck you. You led me on. Um, you're a terrible person. Like you're a terrible person. You're a fuck boy. And I was like, well, God, I, I feel like when I'm actually doing quote unquote, the right thing, about being like, hey, honest about my feelings, um, I was penalized for doing so. And people would like, I, don't, I would want to say demonize me in a certain way where I'm like, well, maybe it is better to kind of slowly peter out. Maybe it is better to just ghost instead of confronting someone. When, spoiler, it is not. <laughs> like, <laughs> And me, <laughs> it is not. But me realizing that like, you know, if I'm honest and upfront and they get upset with me, that's okay. That is okay. And I'm still doing the right thing. And I've definitely gotten better about not ghosting, about not leading people on being, especially I try to be better, especially now before I hook up for anything, being like, hey, what I'm looking for is potentially something more casual. But then the troubling or the thing that makes it troublesome is I'm 
Well, it actually kind of depends if I'm looking for something casual, depending on our connection. So right. like, I, I don't, I can't necessarily always say that first, but I have gotten better about being more direct and being like, Hey, I had a lot of fun. Um, I, I just don't necessarily see this going anywhere. And I want to be honest to you about it or whatever, probably framing it better than that. And trying to know that even if they get frustrated or angry with me, I don't like they're entitled to that response. And I don't see how they respond three weeks later. You know what I mean? They might be very happy that we, we ended things like that instead of them living in this unnerving limbo of me not responding or me keeping waiting to respond 48 hours later, being like, Hey, sorry, I'm busy. Okay. What does that mean? Do you still want to hang out? Do you not want to hang out? So yeah, I, I, it's been a really challenging process of being more direct and letting people feel their emotions, knowing that it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with me. Just people respond to rejection poorly and that's okay. And again, something I really do struggle with currently. It's really hard. I mean, rejection can really sting in ways that I think we're not prepared for all the time, especially if someone does feel that connection, that unrequited connection, and they've built up a fantasy or an idea about their date or their lover uh, to mean something more than what that experience means to the other person. It's such a common experience. But I think you, know, you bring up such a great point. It's equally hard to be ghosted and it's equally hard to be strung along, right? And have someone peter out slowly. So I usually come from this place of direct is the best medicine, even though it does sting sometimes in in the moment, but it might sting and people might experience some of the stages of grief as they process that. But I think it's the best way and the kindest way, unless there's a safety issue that you think might happen as a whiplash yeah. to being direct. Yeah, absolutely. I only say like break up clearly if you're not at risk, if your mm -hmm. safety is not at risk, it is the better thing. And just, yeah, it's the, especially when people for me are like, wow, you have no right to be a sex expert. You claim to be ethical. You are not ethical. And like, they really just dig into me and my work because of this. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's hard to not second guess yourself at times. Shit. Did I really do something wrong here? Was I not as communicative as possible? And but I, I've really been, I think, just so much more direct in the beginning in a way that I haven't been, I feel like, ever before. Also, I have a book called Boy Slut. I, I don't know exactly what, what you're expecting in terms of dating me. <laughs> but, like, especially the people who are, like, end up wanting to get, like, monogamous and have kids. And I was like, what <laughs> gave you that impression? <laughs> that, that is what I wanted. But with my uh, girlfriend now, one thing, we had this conversation and I, and I told her kind of how I've been struggling with rejecting people and kind of casually dating because if I decide I don't want to, it gets blown up and I really can't have another breakup. But I kind of told her as we started to get to know each other and I said like, hey, I really like you. I like spending time with you. I don't see this being my forever relationship. Uh, I, I think for me, I actually think it's very important as I'm slowly learning for my queer identity to for my primary partner to be a man. Uh, I like having access to gay male spaces. I don't like the fact that when I go into a gay bar and I go with a woman, even though she's had sex with more women there and I've had sex with more of the guys there than any of the gay men, all that, it still doesn't matter. We're still perceived as the straight couple who's going in and co-opting the space. That said, I understand why gay people are sensitive to this. However, it just makes me feel very excluded and straight, which is not what I want to feel. So I told her, like, I really just see me and my, my primary partner being a man for my queer identity. Um, that said, I like you. I like spending time with you. Um, I, I want to keep spending time with you. And I, I'm also afraid that certain nice behaviors I do are perceived as being part of the relationship escalator. And I've noticed that with people who, when I try to date more casually, but let's say I take them out to a birthday dinner. In their mind, they're like, okay, this is becoming more serious versus I take my best friends out to a birthday dinner as well. This is something I would do for anyone who I love, not just a partner, not just someone who I want to be my wife or husband. So I express this. I'm like, I want to be able to do cutesy things with you without being worried that I'm leading you on. Are you okay with this type of relationship? She's also 32. And if she wants kids, like it's something I don't want to date for too, however many long, if this is something she's really looking for right now. And her response was, 
Zach, thank you for sharing. Uh, I really just want you to be happy. And whether that's with me or not with me, um, I'm okay with that. You know, if you do end up finding, you know, a man and wanting to leave me, please don't kick me to the curb. I don't want to feel like I was just disposed of in this temporary person. I still would like to be in your life as friends, still like to have sex with you. Uh, cause I'm assuming you'll, I'm like, yeah, we can still do that. I'll be poly no matter what. Don't worry. Um, and, uh, uh I'm okay with our relationship kind of evolving at that point. But now that I kind of know this, I can kind of set my expectations and it's been okay. It's actually been like the relationship has been going well and, and I'm no longer in my head about, ugh, if this doesn't work or doesn't last, uh, how might things end? And it's something I had never really tried to do before because actually my previous therapist who I don't love in hindsight, but his, his always mentality was, well, you never know. Things might change. So you don't want to voice anything from the beginning. But I think for my sanity and for clarity, I think it actually is better for me to voice things in the beginning. And if things change in the light of actually, I do want to marry you, then I express it. And maybe she wants to marry me. Maybe she does not. But I'd rather it change that way than kind of the reverse way. I agree. It it creates a, just a much more realistic and sustainable trajectory, right? Because Sometimes feelings do change and people do want something other than what they initially stated, whether it's more connection, more monogamy or not, right? We just, we evolve. And so that is a possibility, but really being clear about where you are in the moment can help to set the stage for so much more clarity and kindness. And that really, I think, is a part of what it means to be ethically non-monogamous is just being present with where you are in the moment and what you can offer someone in terms of commitment or play or experiences and what you can't. It's it's also, I mean, now I'm a little bit luckier in that I predominantly date non-monogamous people, or at least, you know, because as someone who is non-monogamous, and I don't want to say they're better at communicating. Theoretically, they should be. I know plenty of non-monogamous people who are equally terrible communicators, lying to themselves about being non-monogamous, have a panic attack every time their partner goes on a date with someone else, but is too afraid to admit it or gets super jealous and doesn't act on it well. So like, I don't want to put polyamorous people on a pedestal. We still struggle immensely with communication. And I feel like a lot of us are actually in denial about what our needs are and feel embarrassed to admit that we are actually jealous or feeling insecure. But generally, I'm able to have these types of conversations more honestly and more openly and from the beginning because kind of non-monogamy necessitates having these conversations because there's no expectation as to what your how your relationship is going to look. So from the beginning, there is an expectation that you express, hey, this is what I'm looking for in a relationship. Here's what here's what the word relationship means to me. Here's what the word partner means for me. Here's what I expect from my boyfriend or girlfriend or partner or they friend. So I've been having a little bit better luck. I feel like the non-monogamous world, or sorry, the monogamous world is actually another uh, set with another challenge is that luckily I don't have to run into or t- typically I'm not running into the same exact way. So you mentioned at the start of our conversation that's that being rejected is not something that you necessarily struggle with. What tips and pointers would you have about or for folks who do struggle with being rejected and how they can move through that? It, it is so hard to answer that question. And it was so hard to answer that question in the book, right? Because of course, like, rejection feels so personal. It it, it really does. And no matter how many times you tell yourself, um, oh, it's not me. There could be a million things that they're not interested in me. They were having a bad day, uh, whatever it is. Um, I I think for me, what's been the most helpful is actually having friendships and communities that I know that like, oh, I am loved. I, I am great. You know, I, I'm, I'm a special person. Someone would be lucky to have me because I do have these friends who kind of, um, what's the word? Uh, not judge me up, but um, they hype you uh, up. Gas me up. I, I guess that's the word. You know? <laughs> but knowing, I think when you have these other connections and relationships, whether they are friends, whether they are other partners, again, if you're monogamous, probably not. But you feel like, okay, my whole self worth is not. I, I, if you have zero friends or zero other partners, I feel like you can take it much more seriously. But when you know other people love you, when you know other people enjoy spending time with you, you can really somewhat be like, oh, this is just one person's opinion. 
Um, so I, I think, yeah, having that support system of people who love you and gas you up can really make you feel okay. Yeah. Like, no, I am lovable. I truly am lovable. I just was not this person's cup of tea. Yeah. I really appreciate you saying that because it is really hard sometimes not to personalize rejection because we immediately think, wow, I'm not good enough for this other person, but it's so important to take someone else off a pedestal and really remember that oil and water don't mix very well, but they both are really uh, strong complements in other recipes, right? And when we look at rejection as being an indication that we weren't a good fit, not that we're better or worse than someone else, that can really take some of the sting out. But it's, I, I agree, it's so important to have other community around and have other relationships where you feel really held and really adored and loved and supported because that, that is the antidote to feeling alone and in isolation in that rejection. Because that's a hard place to be. Yeah, because no matter I, – I, like I went from a place of being someone who was so – like I could not even like talk to someone. I, I was so afraid of rejection of someone being like, oh, I'm not interested. And again, I don't want to make it seem like it doesn't sting. But you kind of have that initial response of freaking out. And now I can somewhat talk to myself being like, hey – I'm just not their type and that's okay. And when you can accept you're not going to be everyone's type, it does get a lot easier. And it's one of those things where I think, unfortunately, it is somewhat of an age thing. I think it's very challenging at 19, 20, 21 to take, to not take this personally. And of course that's a frustrating thing to say where it's just like, eventually, you know, you, you get rejected and you realize nothing changes. You know, I got rejected and I'm going to wake up tomorrow and go to work and I still have friends who love me and I have family who loves me and oh, okay, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's, there is something to be said about like you get, you realize that rejection doesn't m- matter r- really. And, and that, I think that can only come with just some time and experience and like perseverance of being rejected and then coming through the other side and being like, well, turns out I'm still the same person. Yeah, that that's so spot on. I think as we get older, it's easier to understand uh, that there are billions and billions of people in this world, and there will be more people for whom to meet and potentially connect with. I know when I was younger, I always was faced with this like timeline, right? I have to find my person, find my person, I've got to find my person. And that created this dynamic that every rejection just felt like agony not only because there wasn't a connection there, but because I felt like, wow, I am, it's taking so much longer than I expected to find my person. So there was this clock that I was on that created this experience of scarcity, but with many rejections and many relationships ending with people who I thought were going to be my person, you just kind of realize that there are a lot of other people out there that you can meet. And it's to your point, like nothing else really changes. And I don't mean to diminish the pain of rejection because it does hurt, especially when there are big feelings and uneven feelings, but moving through the grief and giving yourself permission to grieve and feel everything you feel can give you space to reflect on who it is you are looking for and who it is you are. And, and take that knowledge and that wisdom from the, play, the pain into the next opportunities that you have to meet new folks. And really, like to that end, like, like there's nothing wrong with wanting to be in a relationship, of mm-hmm. course. Like, you know, like if, you, if you're someone who's happier being in a relationship, but also I, I can think of this with the people who write in for Sex Explain It or some of the people I've dated where it's, they're putting a lot of pressure on themselves the same way that you were. And if you can remove some of that pressure uh, from yourselves, from finding this right person and for being like, I need to have a boyfriend or girlfriend or partner or they friend, um, rejection becomes a little bit less painful, I think. It does. It does. Well, Zach, thank you so much for coming on the show today and talking about your experiences and your book. Where can people find you if they want to learn more about you, your work, or if they want to order your new book? Yes. So ZacharyZane.com. 
Um, all my information is there, and you you can buy the book anywhere books are sold. Every any bookshop, um, Amazon, um, and then bookshop.org is kind of the one that supports independent bookstores. So that's always good to do as well. And then Zachary Zane underscore on Twitter and Instagram. I'm also going uh, doing a book tour. Uh, so throughout May and June for Pride as well. So I will be in LA, SF, Chicago, New York, Boston, Nashville, some more places. So if you go to my website, you can see if I'm coming to a city near you. I also have some virtual events too. So that way, no matter where you are, you can at least kind of tune in. Amazing. Um, yeah, but that's it. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Modern Intimacy Podcast. On Instagram, follow me at Dr. Kate Balistrieri and at The Modern Intimacy. On TikTok, check me out at Dr. Kate Balistrieri and on Twitter at Kate Balistrieri. Everyone has questions about mental health, sex, and relationships. Send yours to me via DM on Instagram or email them to questions at modernintimacy.com and I'll answer some at the end of each episode. Visit the website, modernintimacy.com, to schedule a consultation with a member of our team or to sign up for our newsletter. Let's meet back here next week. New episodes air every Tuesday. Reminder, this podcast is for education and entertainment purposes only and is not a substitute for mental health services.